Welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, where each time we meet, we run down the IT news of the week with a variable degree of snarkiness. I'm your host, Stephen Foskett, and joining me today, filling in for Tom Hollingsworth, who's off in California for Networking Field Day this week, is a new Field Day delegate and fellow podcaster, John Meyer. Welcome to the show. Stephen, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure, actually, to join you guys here on The Rundown. As Stephen mentioned, my name's John Meyer. I'm a host of the John Meyer podcast, but also a creator behind customer case studies and compelling voice of the customer. You can join and look at me for on YouTube at John Meyer or check me out on LinkedIn. Excellent. Thanks. And it's good to have you here, John. Um, you know, we've been, uh, well, we'll talk about it at the end, but uh, surprise, you'll see John at Cloud Field Day next week. Um, so you gave it away already? I know. I spilled the beans. It's crazy. Um, so, hey, this is uh, today is National Peking Duck Day. And as anyone who's ever been to a Chinese restaurant knows, that means you had to order today, yesterday, or you can't have it. Oh, man, it's a good thing I put in my Uber Eats order. So, Stephen, did you also know it's National Winnie the Pooh Day? Everybody uh, loves Winnie. Indubitably, because it's also National Thesaurus Day. And <laughs> since actually Winnie the Pooh Day, uh, Winnie the Pooh is, is public domain. So we can do anything we want with Winnie the Pooh today. Ooh, so I can be like, woohoo. No, just <laughs> yeah, nice. that's what I was going for. That's what I was going for. Um, I'm going to do the rest of the show in Winnie the Pooh language. So here we go. No, I'm kidding. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the news of the uh, of the week in IT. Uh, one week after Amazon announced 18,000 layoffs, Amazon CEO Andy Jassy is credited with saying how AWS innovation is helping Amazon and its customers. Uh, AWS is a separate business inside of Amazon, as you probably know. A uh, $20.5 billion side business reported in their 2022 Q3 revenue. You might even say that Amazon is the side business to AWS. Um, Andy did note that AWS employees would not be affected by this layoff round at uh, Amazon. John, how is Am AWS not laying off while Amazon is? And, and what's happening here? All right, so to know everything is that Amazon was the core start of it and they created AWS as a side business to their website. Well, it has taken off and is one of the well-known cloud public providers as noted by Gardner on their reports. Well, AWS is always continuously innovating with their breadth and depth of services. They did note that they have 18,000 laying off for Amazon, but that's more or less their corporate and some of the other side, other stuff that they're dealing with. Well, Andy Jassy was at one of their fulfillment centers talking highly about their one IoT product, Amazon Monotron, and how it saved them potentially billions of dollars in lost revenue based off the machinery. What Amazon Monotron is, is it takes temperature and vibration readings and sends that automatically back to AWS for real-time machine learning. Why is this important? Well, think of one of their service centers, their main belt going down. Now your order's not making it in prime delivery. Well, they're leaning heavily on AWS and all their services that they have in there. And in fact, their hiring hasn't slowed down because everybody's moving towards the public cloud in a number of cases for those cost savings and cloud innovation opportunities. So Stephen, let me talk a little bit about you. So we're seeing that IT spending isn't as strong as it could be from seamlessly confirmed by recent reports with Gardner. Now they predicted a 0.8% growth in 2022. Well, spending was down actually 0.2%. You don't really think that doesn't sound like much, but are things looking much better in 2023? What's your take? Yeah, I I'm looking at this and uh, kind of agreeing, kind of nodding my head. I thought 2022 would be a modest increase, um, you know, kind of a little bit of an upturn from uh, after the pandemic. And as we came back, uh, the fact that it ended up being actually down is, you know, not great, as they say. And the fact that it ended up being down further than uh, than anyone expected is about you know one percent decline. But remember, that's a one percent decline over twenty one, uh, which you know wasn't the greatest year in IT spending either. Now we're looking at twenty three and trying to decide what's going to be happening. Um, a lot of the analysts, of course, are putting on their looking in their crystal balls, which uh, hint uh, financial analyst crystal balls um, don't actually tell the future. Uh, just doesn't work that way. 
if it did, um, we would know all sorts of things, but but we don't. And so uh, a lot of them are kind of revising their crystal ball guesses and saying, you know what, maybe 23 doesn't look that good either. Uh, that's kind of what I'm seeing out there as well. I would not be surprised at all if spending continued to slide a little bit in 23. Uh, we're seeing that on the consumer side. Uh, we're seeing that in a lot of other areas. And I think that that's going to continue in enterprise spending as well. So uh, this is not great news for the entire industry. And um, I think that it kind of matches what we're feeling in our guts. John, attackers use login details obtained from third-party platforms, uh, not uh, for a few, but for thousands of Norton LifeLock customers. Uh, they received a warning notifying them that hackers have successfully compromised Norton Password Manager. Uh, we talked about LastPass. Uh, John, what's going, what's going on here? Um, what are people supposed to do about securing their passwords as it seems that more and more of these things are getting um, uh, breached? Uh, is this the end of password management software? I think it's coming close to the end of password management software. And in fact, I might revert back to some stickies on my desk. If you think about it, Norton LifeLock customers actually had their accounts compromised in early December, but they didn't note it into December 12th. Well, uh, you know, a notice went out from Gen Digital, the parent company of Norton LifeLock, and said that the likely culprit was a credential stuffing attack and third-party attack. This is not the first third-party attack that we've heard of. LastPass had theirs in August, and a lot of a lot of them recommend using multi-factor authentication. So now you have your password and multi-factor authentication. But really, is a password management system needed anymore? Are we veering towards it, going away from it? Are we utilizing different services? And if you think about it, you know, the company said that it found the intruders actually compromised the accounts as far back as December 1st as they noted. Uh, what they really did is found a username and password that was on a well-known site that was already hacked and breached, and they just attempted it there, which allowed them into the system. So is any online password thing safe? No. Will I revert back to my stickies? I don't know. Don't look at my desk, but we'll have to find out. You know, Stephen, I know you're a storage guy, and Pure Storage was eager to the eco game with their so-called evergreen storage concept. But now they're backing this up with an energy-efficient SLA for Pure One customers. Customers can get service credits and their capacity per watt expectations aren't met. Though this should be pretty easy for Pure to ensure. Since storage is your game, what's your take on the news, Stephen? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I was actually really happy with this. Um, just uh, we've, been, we've been working with Pure since the very beginning. Uh, we actually did a 10-year anniversary video with them uh, because they presented their first presentation at Tech Field Day. And I think it's important to note this evergreen concept was around right from the very start and is pretty cool. Essentially, it's a ship of Theseus for storage where you can swap out different parts and keep the data and um, uh, sort of the storage array online. Um, in fact, uh, what, I've what I've heard is that a lot of Pure customers still have their original array or some component of it, probably the power cord, um, still in, in production, even though they have updated every other part of it since then to get to the modern, uh, modern system. It's kind of cool, isn't it? I mean, imagine if you could like swap out like all the parts of your car and still have the same car at the end. That's kind of what uh, this evergreen concept is. Uh, Pure has been talking a lot about how this is an eco advantage and also how all flash is an eco advantage over disk. And I have to agree. Uh, it doesn't take a genius to imagine that, uh, you know, moving to solid state storage, having more efficient storage, uh, not, you know, getting new hardware and throwing out the old hardware all the time is, is more efficient. And now they're backing that up with an SLA, which is kind of cool for their, um, you know, their OPEX uh, Pure One customers. They'll get an energy efficiency SLA. I think the only uh, kind of downside here is that uh, the uh, SLA is, is watts per terabyte. And that's like super easy for Pure to meet because obviously they know how much power the system takes. They know how much system you've got and they can just say, yeah, the system won't exceed that because of course it won't exceed that. But that's cool, right? I mean, I, I like that. Um, and also this gives us, I think more importantly, a baseline 
where uh, we can start talking about watts per terabyte. I think that's the real story here. So it's not so much the SLA, it's the fact that we actually might actually know how much power it's costing to deliver this storage and be able to compare that on kind of an apples to apples basis against other vendors. And that's really, I think, where this goes and starts getting interesting. John, uh, rumors that Microsoft is going to expand chat GPT access due to their open AI investment continue to swirl. And uh, we've heard that uh, CEOs were buzzing about using chat GPT style AI while they were meeting at the World Economic Forum. As for me, I'm just hoping that they can, uh, you know, make the thing open enough that I can actually ever log in and try it. Um, are more companies uh, going to be focusing on chat GPT? Is Microsoft going to be rolling this out? And are the rumors that uh, we're going to all just use chat instead of Google search in the future? Is that true? Okay, so let's understand ChatGPT. First of all, Stephen, I was able to successfully log into it after a couple of days. They were at capacity, and the engineers do have some humor when they're, they don't have enough capacity. You know, talking about the public interest of OpenAI, which surged in November, ChatGPT, which is a text-based chatbot that actually can draft, pose, even complete computer code, uh, can put together a presentation. In fact, Stephen, don't tell anybody, but they put together this one. So, you know, using chat GPT is actually very enhanced and it's continuously learning. There are con some concerns, ethical concerns, writing essays for students and understanding some of the stuff, but it does help you actually get started. You still have to be an expert in your field to understand if it produced the right results and if it's going to provide valuable content. Now, if you look at some of the stuff that comes out of chat GPT, it gets you a starting point and it's only going to get better. Is it replacing Google search? Well, I'm not sure I can say go Google it, uh, uh, go chat it, chat GP. Yeah, I'm not really sure about that. But Microsoft has actually added $1 billion or taken a stake into the open AI in 2019. Now they are increasing their open AI search stuff in order to for chat GPT. But did you also know in other news that Microsoft is laying off almost 10,000 employees. I wonder if they can go over to the chat GPT side. Hmm. So Steven, Supermicro, Dell, HPE, Cisco, and others have introduced the first server lines based on Intel's recent announcement of the fourth generation Xeon processors. Of course, NVIDIA is also supporting these new processors with their H100 DGX platform. Let's take a look, closer look under the hood and see how these Sapphire Rapids bring new capabilities to these devices. The, you know, now that the Sapphire Rapids pro products have been officially announced, we, we're seeing a lot more people talking about what the processor can do. And I think it's important to recognize, as we mentioned last week, that Sapphire Rapids has actually been out there for about a year, uh, there's been uh, early, early testers. There's been a lot of people using the platform. In fact, I'm hearing that some of the hyperscalers are already rolling it out in volume uh, for customers. Um, there certainly have been a lot of appearances of Sapphire Rapid servers at events like OCP and supercomputing, uh, running CXL, all that stuff. And so we're finally getting a look at uh, where the rubber meets the road, which is uh, servers and storage devices that are using Sapphire Rapids Xeon in production. And it's coming from basically all the companies. I don't want to give short shrift to the others, you know, Inspur and people like that, but I'm really going to focus here on the ones that uh, matter uh, the most to me and my customers and my, you know, community here at Enterprise Tech. So, so we're going to start a little bit with, uh, with Supermicro. Uh, we'll talk about Dell, HPE, Cisco, NVIDIA, as you mentioned. But really, uh, I think it's safe to say that we're going to see Sapphire Rapids from everybody. So starting off with uh, Supermicro, so we've got the X13 generation of, of servers now. Uh, Supermicro has uh, numerically numbered theirs, and it's so helpful because you can know kind of which generation the server is just from the, just from the model name. Uh, and, and of course, Supermicro covers everything across the, uh, across the spectrum. Um, uh, full disclosure, uh, you know, I bought a Supermicro server for the office and, um, you know, that there, that's probably what's running in the cloud. It's probably what's running in the software defined storage solution that you're running, that sort of thing. They're, they're everywhere, hyper-converged. 
And the reason that they're everywhere is because this is a company that does a really nice job of putting together uh, pretty standard enterprise grade servers in a variety of configurations. And that's really what we've got here with the X13 generation. We've got everything from the, uh, you know, the, the, the blade, super blade stuff. We've got big twin, we've got grand twin, we've got their ultra servers, we've got their storage servers, we've got edge. Uh, we even have eight socket servers from Supermicro, and including ultra high density servers that use uh, the uh, multi socket design from Intel to bring the most cores possible in uh, in a server platform, which is pretty cool, uh, and pretty much everything in between. Because again, this is Supermicro, uh, so. I'm really looking forward to seeing kind of where this stuff goes uh, once we start to get it in production with uh, the many, many, many OEMs that use Supermicro in production. The next thing I want to turn to is Dell, of course. So Dell's uh, PowerEdge line is really, really important in enterprise tech. We see them everywhere. We also see these a lot with uh, OEMs using Dell as a hardware platform. Dell, uh, of course, has implemented the fourth generation Xeons in the usual suspects, you know, your uh, regular, you know, PowerEdge, uh, DL360, DL380, those kind of guys, you know. We also have them in their, you know, R series, the big ones. I think the biggest news here in the Dell line is the, the big guys, the R960, R860, their quad socket servers. Uh, Dell hadn't updated those uh, for a long time because Cooper Lake was really designed, that was the third generation for an eight core Xeon, was really designed for hyperscalers more than for, you know, regular people like us. And so Dell uh, really had a lot, a big jump here between the previous generation and the next generation for their quad socket servers. And I think that that's really, really exciting. Uh, we also had a big announcement from Dell on a partnership with NVIDIA, that they're using a lot more NVIDIA all across the range. I think that's great news for Dell. It's, of course, good for NVIDIA as well. Um, and, and overall, uh, you know, looking at the Dell range, I think that this is a solid update, especially, as I said, if you want a ton of processor cores. You know, Steven, I feel like I'm missing, I don't want to jump in there, but I feel like I'm missing out. I used to have a few of those DL360s actually here in my house in my basement. And you're wondering why, because I was a nerd and I liked hardware and building things. I think I'm all missing out on some of this fourth generation. I th do anybody got a 360 line around I can upgrade? I, I think that, uh, hey, Michael, um, hook a guy up, would you? Uh... <laughs> uh, I'll be right back. <laughs> So let's move on to the HPE side. Um, we, uh, on HPE, uh, they have already announced their Gen 11 server lineup with AMD and ARM servers as well, as we covered on the rundown previously. Well, now the Gen 11 line, uh, unsurprisingly, includes uh, fourth generation Xeon. Uh, it, again, is pretty much what you'd expect. I think for me, the big news on the HPE side was more what they're doing it in other areas. Uh, they've updated their storage systems with the fourth generation Xeons, and I think that that's going to deliver uh, quite a lot of benefit uh, for storage customers. Um, finally, let me turn to our friends over at Cisco. Um, as you are aware, UCS is uh, one of the most important uh, blade uh, scalable uh, platforms out there. And Cisco has also adopted the fourth generation Xeons. Uh, one of my questions for Cisco was relating to the X series. So if you remember, Cisco released this really modular, almost disaggregated X series line uh, a couple of years ago. And I was curious how that would play with PCIe 5 and with CXL. Well, uh, to hear Cisco talk about it, the, both the C-Series and the X-Series are updated, and they've had no trouble at all adapting to these new technologies. And I do expect that uh, we'll be seeing CXL uh, rolling out, and I think that that's going to be a pretty powerful technology in combination with the uh, X-Series fabric and, of course, uh, Cisco's really nice intersight management platform. I like what Cisco's done with their UCS system, and now I think this is just going to enhance it a lot more in the condensed platform that they utilized. Absolutely. And, um, and the final platform that we'll talk about here is NVIDIA, of course, uh, so their DGX H100. Now, of course, there's been a lot of talk about Grace Hopper, which is uh, their ARM and uh, Hopper GPU uh, supercomputing disaggregated platform, which is totally awesome. Uh, but it, of course, uh, where the rubber meets the road is, as I was talking to in the Dell section, is basically 
having the Hopper series GPUs rolled out everywhere. And that's really, I think, what we're going to be seeing um, there. They've got a new DGX. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of more announcements of other uh, OEMs building uh, NVIDIA-powered systems for uh, AI processing based on the DGX platform. And, you know, I, I think this is more a vote of confidence than anything else. I mean, we saw Jensen Huang uh, right there in the Intel keynote as the part of the launch for Sapphire Rapids, along with like everybody else in the industry, I might mention. But, you know, Jensen was right there at the beginning. Um, and so I think that, in, uh, you know, the, the partnership between Dell and NVIDIA remains strong. And I think that that's great for overall enterprise tech. Um, John, what's your take, and now that we've kind of gone through, I know it's kind of exhaustive, what, what's your take overall on, on what we're seeing as the upgrades here? I'm seeing a lot of investment and enhancement into the upgrades. Uh, I'm wondering, where, uh, you know, we're at the fourth generation, we're a third generation one, but we, we can get there another time. Uh, the Supermicro had an interesting story when they were kind of originally getting this going where the system and I, I we got to share out this article on how they gave him the actual system and put it in his car outside of a box and said yeah this is the only one how nerve-wracking is that for having your first very like you know prototype system sitting in the back of your car i think the investment into the fourth generation is a long time coming and an announcement for it which will enhance these hyperscalers there are so many that are going to utilize it we're not going to call them out individually but you have to realize that what you know they're doing so for the Xeon processors and enhancing the hyperscalers that are being used by these companies, there are still physical servers in the data centers where you don't have to worry about, but you still have to improve upon them for the end user and the customer. So I think this is a huge accomplishment. Yeah, absolutely. And a special shout out to friend of the show, uh, Patrick uh, Kennedy, uh, as mentioned with Serve the Home, uh, toting around the only one uh, in the back of his rental car. Um, I love you, Patrick. Uh, and, I, and I love your fun videos with Supermicro. That was great. Um, yeah, my take overall is that uh, it's pretty unsurprising what's been announced because, of course, we kind of knew what was coming. We've been watching the development of Sapphire Rapids this whole year. And now that it's here, we're saying, yep, yep, it's pretty much what we thought. Um, for me, the thing that I'm really looking forward to is what happens once CXL is more embraced. Because as you can see with, for example, the UCSX series and with some of the super micro stuff and some of the things that uh, NVIDIA are doing, uh, there's a lot of interest in disaggregating and building new form factors. And CXL enables that in a way that we haven't really seen up until now. That's what we're talking about on our Utilizing CXL podcast is sort of where this technology will go. And one way that I think it's going to go, and I think that we're going to be watching for this in 23 and 24, is new server form factors, more flexible form factors, where memory is not so tied to the motherboard with the CPU and so on, where CPUs maybe even are um, a little bit more modular. And, and ultimately, where we go to more of a rack scale architecture, where you can have a rack of memory and a rack of storage and a rack of processing and a rack of accelerators, and all that just sort of works together. Um, we don't have that yet. Uh, we weren't going to get that because literally this uh, AMD and Intel just announced CXL support like in the last month. Uh, so that's new. Uh, we're still at 1.1. Uh, but hold your horses because I think... Uh, what these servers look like in 2024 and 2025 is going to be radically different. And I think we're going to have a lot of exciting stuff to talk about here on The Rundown. Speaking of exciting stuff, let's look forward to what's coming uh, this week and in the future. Uh, right now, as I mentioned, Tom Hollingsworth is emceeing uh, the Networking Field Day event. Uh, so tune in at Tech Field Day website and, of course, Tech Field Day LinkedIn, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the 18th through the 20th for Networking Field Day 30. Hey, Stephen, I was hoping you'd let me announce Cloud Field Day 16, which is happening next week, January 25th. And guess what? This is my first in person as a delegate. So I'm super excited to be there with all the other delegates that are happening and joining us. I think we have like 14. This is going to be an awesome event. You got to check out Cloud Field Day. Follow us on hashtag CFD16. We're all over the place. We'll be sharing so much during the week. So, Stephen, thank you so much for allowing me to announce this one. You got it, man. It'll be good to see you in person. Um, also uh, coming up, we've got Cisco Live EMEA in Amsterdam, February 7th and 8th. 
Um, as I mentioned last week, we've got Edge Field Day coming, February 22nd and 23rd. We're going to be talking about the uh, Edge Compute world. Uh, we also have a Tech Field Day focusing on the CXL technology that I've been talking about, March 8th and 9th. So check out the Tech Field Day website for more information about that. So thanks for watching the Gestalt IT Rundown. You can catch episodes every Wednesday as a YouTube video, or you can find us in your favorite podcast application. By the way, please do give us a rating and a review. And if you can, maybe give me a review that says that I'm better than Tom. That would be awesome. We'll be back uh, next Wednesday uh, to talk about the IT news of the week that was. Until then, for myself, uh, for Tom Hollingsworth, uh, John Meyer, and all of us here in the Gestalt IT family, here's wishing you and yours an awesome uh, Sapphire Rapids Day. <laughs> <laughs>